Welcome to Politipeeps. My name is Edward Hofer, and I'm here with Dr. Mary Ruert. Hello, Mary. How are you today? I'm doing really well, and I hope you are too, Ed. Well, it's really cold here, but I hear down in uh, Texas it's a little warmer. What's the temperature like there? I'm not sure what it is exactly now, but we're predicted to have 77 today, so it's probably about 70. <laughs> are you going to spend some time outside? I hope so. <laughs> oh, that would be really great. So today we want to actually talk a little bit about weather-related phenomenon. We want to talk a little bit about climate change. Mm -hmm. Now, your background is more in the medical industry, your biomedical research, if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly, but you have some interesting ideas about the climate. Can you tell us what the libertarian position on climate change is? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that there's a libertarian position per se on climate change because many libertarians believe that climate change is happening and that people are responsible for it. Uh, many people believe that climate change is happening and that humans are not responsible for it. <laughs> and there are some people that are not convinced that climate change is happening. So obviously, uh, depending on your viewpoint, you might think different things. But there is a libertarian, quote, solution to uh, how climate change would be addressed in a libertarian society. And so I thought maybe I'd go into that a little bit for you. So one of the things is we really have three points that we emphasize in the environment. One is an end to sovereign immunity. Two is full restitution. If you, you know, dump garbage on my lawn, I'd expect you to clean it up, for example. And then the third would be um, privatizing land and beast. I'm going to talk about the first two because they relate to climate change. So the reason we need to end sovereign immunity is that the government does a lot of bad things to the environment. But even when it's convicted in court, it often says, well, we have sovereign immunity, so the victims get nothing. And uh, this is true in climate change as well, because probably 10% of the fossil fuels that we burn in the U.S. or under U.S. jurisdiction, I should say, are consumed by the U.S. military. So the first thing is that the government is the biggest single consumer of fossil fuels. And unless they do something about their consumption, uh, you know, you're not going to, you're going to have a hard time, I should say, limiting other consumption. The other, the other thing, of course, is the, the so, so if you ended sovereign immunity, the government would have to, you know, clean up their garbage, so to speak. And so, um, you know, they would be just as liable as individuals. And the reason this is important is that the government also extends their sovereign immunity to corporations to some extent. So corporations, if they pollute or do something else uh, to harm people and the environment, you know, they only have to clean up their garbage to the extent that of corporate assets. The government relieves the corporate owners of any liability. And that's, you know, not the way the world should be working. Uh, the other, you know, I'll tell you a little story about this too, because the government regulations that are supposed to protect us actually don't. When I was living in Kentucky, uh, a couple women came to my door and said, will you help us stop pollution in, in the, um, the river? And I said, well, are, did you talk to the EPA about these corporations dumping? And they said, oh, yeah, we talked to them. But you see, the corporations pay a fine, and the fine is smaller <laughs> than the cost of getting uh, non-polluting solutions to the problem, right? So she says, we're, we're desperate. And, and we thought maybe if we all talked to the corporate heads, maybe we could shame them into <laughs> backing off. But you see, this is part of the problem. Even when government is supposedly taking care of this communal property we supposedly have, the river, uh, it's, it's not doing a very good job. It's actually letting the corporations get away with paying a small fine. And that's because, of course, they're contributing to the campaign chests of the people <laughs> that are in charge of this. So this, you know, this is why full restitution is really important, because if you have to clean up your pollution, it is so expensive, you're not going to pollute. <laughs> so that's really the way libertarians address that. And now you might ask, well, how does that, how does that relate to this climate change. So 
if we were convinced that climate change was due to like, you know, a particular chemical, like we've talked about CFCs in the past, then what would end up happening is the people who were harmed by, uh, you know, this change in climate caused by these chemicals, you know, they would, they would be suing the corporation or the business that actually produced them. And so what would happen is they'd have to pay restitution. Now, the nice thing about that is that that would increase the price of the CFC or the other chemical. And so only people who really needed that chemical would be buying it. People that could find substitutes would not. And this is important because back in the days when we were talking about CFCs and banning them, this really hit a lot of people in the third world hard because they couldn't really, um, when they were just banned, they couldn't get any replacement for their, um, you know, refrigerator coolants and things like that. And, and that, of course, hit them very hard because if you can't preserve food, there's going to be a lot of food waste. And if you can't preserve food, it might even, if you're poor, you know, create a situation where you go hungry. So, you know, there's a lot of ways. So, so libertarians approach this whole idea of environment very differently than Republicans and Democrats. And I think it's a much better way because I think it would stop pollution. So getting back to the idea of climate change as we think of it today, it's kind of difficult to be really sure that we know the best way to proceed. Because if we, even if we ban all fossil fuels by 2035, it's according to all the calculations I've seen, and my PhD is in biophysics, so I do know something about this. <laughs> We'd only, if at the best, get climate change of 1.25 degrees, one and a quarter degree. It's not enough. So, so, you know, maybe that's not such a good way to go. In fact, there have been people who have calculated that it's actually going to be cheaper for us to pay for dams and uh, other types of, uh, how can I say this, um, in other words, react to the climate change rather than preventing it. It would actually be less expensive. But the other thing is, do we really have, is, 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 are, is human activity really the cause of climate change? And this is not so easy to determine because throughout history, both human and non-human, uh, we've been able to measure the temperature at various times and it's moving around you know it's moving around more than it is in the last century so how can we be sure that it's what we're doing you know and this is this is the real difficulty with climate change is being sure that we know what's causing it and as i often say to people who don't have a science background if we can't even predict tomorrow's temperature how can we predict what's going to happen 50 years from now absolutely so I have a question for you on that, but a little mm -hmm. background first. There are a lot of people who are concerned about the increases in CO2 in the atmosphere, and they think that human activity has caused it, and that that mm -hmm. is the main driver of climate change. As a result of that, developed nations and states are considering and creating new legislation, banning plastics, zero carbon initiatives like the new Green New Deal, and other issues like that. How much is climate change actually impacting the planet? And what changes do you think need to be made to environmental policy in the United States? Well, actually, you know, most of the CO2 uh, increase happened uh, before, um, I think it was before 1950. And of course, we've industrialized a lot since then. So it's kind of difficult to think it's CO2. In fact, uh, James Hansen, who really was the uh, scientist who started talking to Congress in 1988 about all of this, has backed off and said, no, it's, it's not CO2. It's other types of greenhouse gases because it doesn't correlate. So you can't lay it at the foot of CO2. Plus, the Earth actually has this... Um, balancing mechanism going on so you know when co2 goes up plant life does too and then what happens is the plants because that's fertilizer for the plants they breathe in co2 and put out oxygen we breathe in oxygen and put out co2 so when co2 goes up plant life does too and so it's it, the earth has sort of a, a balancing act that it does to keep temperatures more or less stable. Obviously, they are not totally stable, but they have this balancing 
thing they can do. So what happens when CO2 goes up is crop production goes up too, which means more food, <laughs> which can be a really good thing because then it makes food less expensive. So there are a lot of, again, uncertainties in this and a lot of factors that haven't really been considered by a lot of the people who are talking about climate change. They seem to be very focused on CO2, even though the data doesn't support it. Um, and actually, when you measure temperature by satellite or temperature on the ground, they don't correlate. So temperatures on the ground are going up. Temperatures in the upper atmosphere are not. And um, some people have said this may be due at least in part to the fact that as we industrialize more, our temperature stations are closer to urban heat production. We all know cities produce more heat than the rural areas. So it's, it's a little uncertain. Uh, again, once again, it's uncertain where all this is, is coming. Do you have a, an opinion on how we should change U.S. policy in response to climate change? It sounds like you're concerned about the accuracy of our measurements and our position. What do you think we should do policy-wise? Well, one thing I don't think we should do is I don't think we should um, ban fossil fuels or limit their use because, first of all, it wouldn't make much difference. As I said, the estimates are even if we stopped fossil fuel use by 2035, we'd only get a degree and a quarter change from that. You know, and that's just not very much. I mean, if you think about it, year to year, the Earth temperature fluctuates about seven degrees. You know, there's this seven degree band that we work in. So taking one and a quarter degree off to ban fossil fuels, which is going to devastate our economy, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I, I think obviously we need more science because there's so many uncertainties. And so that's where our attention needs to be if we really think this is a problem. If we ban fossil fuels, we will limit or even limit them. What's going to happen is it will lower our, our wealth creation, our production that's actually going to lower our ability to be able to do the science to know if this is a real problem or not. And if it is a real problem, is it coming from CO2? Is it coming from something else? And how do we change that? So that's the research we need to do. And if we, if we limit fossil fuels before we figure that out, we probably won't ever figure it out because we'll be quite poor. Okay, well, thank you very much. So how can people find you online if they want to find out more about you? The best thing is to go to my website at ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. And there on the lower right-hand corner of the homepage, you can see how to reach me by social media, Facebook, Instagram, the whole bit. <laughs> and this is Polita Peeps, and I'm Edward Hofer. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. And thank you for watching.